It's my honor to, to introduce Professor Bob Axiai. It took us a long time to get him to come here, but I'm very glad that he finally made it. Uh, Bob Ak received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan in 90, well, 1994, 95, and 99. He was also a postdoctoral fellow following his graduation at Michigan, and then he moved to University of uh, Minnesota in Minneapolis. He was there for a few years as an assistant professor in the electrical engineering department, and then Purdue University recruited him, and he's been at Purdue for how many years now? Almost 10 now. Almost 10. Yeah. Almost 10. Uh, Bobak, you're going to see from his work, he does some of the, in my opinion, most exciting work in the MEMS and BioMEMS domain. And uh, I think there's a lot that we're going to learn from him. So with no further ado, Bobak. Thank you very much, Reza. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I know it's been long overdue. Uh, we always talked uh, about coming here, but something or else something happened and never materialized. And finally, I'm very happy to be here uh, to giving this seminar. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of uh, relatively recent work that we are doing in my lab uh, using laser as a fabrication technique for low cost uh, uh, disposable sensors and actuators and microsystems. Uh, my lab works uh, in several different areas. Uh, a lot of it is really applied with clinical applications. Uh, we work a lot with clinicians. I started my life as a traditional MEMS person, my research life using silicon and glass and uh, in implantable devices, uh, sensors. We still do some of that. I'm not doing as much as I used to uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons, the main reason is it's very difficult to get the uh, FDA approval and get it to the clinic. Uh, so we are doing more things these days that uh, are outside the body, uh, ingestible capsules and things that don't go inside the body proper. Uh, so it's easier to use them and get them to the hands of doctors and clinicians. Uh, we work in implantable microsystems, as I, as, you know, as I mentioned a little bit. Uh, this shows actually a little bit old. Uh, work we did a couple of years ago. This is an implantable dosimeter. We do uh, work in the area of radiation uh, therapy, helping radiation therapy to cure cancer. And this is kind of one of the devices. It's, it's implanted in the tumor and it can measure the radiation in wireless. With wireless method, it can measure the radiation that the tumor is receiving. Uh, we work in energy scavenging a little bit. This shows a device that uses music to power a, power, a pressure sensor. Uh, rap music in particular. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about this, but <laughs> anyhow, you, uh, the, the, uh, if you have a movie online, you can watch. Microfluidics, we are working with some uh, uh, micro valves, micro pumps, for, as in particular for drug delivery. This is a micro pump that uh, works based on the heat that's in your finger. We have a phase change liquid in the reservoir down uh, that's touching the finger here, and this phase change liquid, they have a very low uh, very low uh, vapor, uh, very low uh, uh, evaporation point, uh, very high vapor pressure. So basically, this has about 45, 50 degree uh, evaporation point. Uh, so it basically creates a lot of pressure once you touch it. Flexible. This is some the, the area I'm going to focus most mostly today. Flexible bioelectronics uh, that we have been doing uh, more recently. Our work uh, started before actually we got into wound dressing. And uh, we were doing a lot of uh, flexible, stretchable substrates. Uh, a couple of years ago, we got a big program from NSF uh, on BioFlex to develop smart uh, dressing for chronic wounds. Chronic wounds are wounds that are not healing, such as diabetes ulcer and venous ulcer, bed sores, and things like that. A uh, very important healthcare problem. A lot of uh, money goes into that area, uh, mostly for elderly people who have diabetes and other people that are bedridden. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to make a, a smart patch that's flexible, goes on top of the skin, and it can measure important parameters such as pH and oxygen. Uh, these are the two more important ones on the wound. Uh, and it can give drug, for example, an antibiotic if the wound is infected, or oxygen, actually. Oxygen is very important for wound healing. 
Uh, and it has electronics here that can sense and you know, transmit the information out. So this is a collaboration between uh, Purdue and Harvard and Tufts. There are three universities involved in this. So we, again, this has been going on for a couple of years right now. And I'll show, I'll show you some examples of some of the components of this system. This was our, this is our original idea that was kind of sent to NSF. They liked it. Uh, they said, well, we, uh, we have this smart dressing. Uh, this is wound. We can deliver oxygen. Uh, we can sense this stuff. We can deliver drug and this electronics here. So this is, you can see, it's a platform. Uh, again, all of, most of these are low-cost disposable uh, material that are either paper or plastic or PDMS or other materials that uh, soft material. Uh, a, a substrate that we use, I'll show you a couple of examples, uh, as a lot of uh, components of these systems is paper. Uh, paper uh, is uh, very inexpensive, renewable, water absorbent, it can be mass produced, flexible and disposable. So it's, it's pretty good material for making uh, electronics on and sensors. And uh, people like George Whiteside at Harvard uh, started uh, using paper uh, as a material, as a substrate for making uh, uh, chemical sensors uh, a couple of years ago. And what they did, they basically start with a hydrophilic, regular paper is hydrophilic. If you put a drop of water in it, it, weak, it weaks in, correct? It's hydrophilic paper. And then what they do, they use an inkjet printer to print wax, and then so they, so they can pattern various areas, and they can do uh, lab on the chip applications and sensors and devices like that. Uh, at that time, uh, actually around that time, I had a student, Chinese graduate student, very good uh, experimentalist. He was also a very good cook. Actually, there is a correlation between uh, being a good cook and being a good experimentalist. I've, I've learned that actually. Uh, so he was actually, he came to me, he said that yeah, he uses uh, parchment paper at home to make cookies. And he said that, you know, these are, uh, uh, and he brought one to lab one day. It's a, parchment paper is, uh, you can buy it from Walmart. It's, it, it's hydrophobic. And it's, it's different. It's, uh, it has a silicon coating, both sides of it. And I was, we had a laser in the lab next door. I said, this is CO2 laser. I said, you know, why don't you try to write on it and see what happens? It's hydrophobic. Maybe something happens. You know, maybe we find something. Actually, it's, uh, a lot of things are like that in, in my lab, at least, serendipitous. So uh, what we did, he did that. And uh, it, was, it worked the first time. So what happened, he basically, once you write with this laser on, on this hydrophobic paper, the areas that you write on, it becomes hydrophilic. And so you can then basically put it in different aqueous solutions, take it out, uh, embed material, and it do a lot of interesting things, as you'll see. So we said, well, this is very interesting. We can, in one, with one laser, with the same laser, you also can cut. For example, if you increase the power, you can cut it, okay? So it's nice. You can pattern uh, areas. This, these areas are patterned, uh, they become hydrophilic, and then you can also cut in the same uh, uh, rest, in the same setup, basically. So. Uh, and we, we started looking deeper into this and see, well, let's see what, I mean, uh, you can write, I mean, with our laser, smaller, I mean, down to 60 micron, which is, you know, enough for a lot of our applications. Uh, so we started looking at in, in this sense uh, and uh, trying to understand what really happens after you uh, ablate. It's, it's, it's a process of ablation. It's a thermal process. So what happens, laser heats the surface, it ablates the silicon. The silicon gets ablated, gets vaporized, and then gets redeposited on the surface. Uh, these are the lines that are ablated here. And as you can see, these lines are actually not recessed into the paper. They are on top of the paper, actually. It's kind of interesting. It's not like you're cutting. It's, we thought it's, it would be recessed, like trench. But actually, it gets redeposited on top of it. Uh, and uh, with, uh, if you look closer at, as you know, into these areas, you'll see that it, it has a lot of nanostructure, fiber, fibrous nanostructure associated with it. And that's one reason it becomes hydrophilic. Uh, there are two reasons. One is physical, the other one is chemical reason. You can see the contact angle here. This is before uh, 115 degree hydrophobic, and then this is after. It becomes 20 degree, very hydrophilic. And this can actually last, I mean, we have, you know, if you keep it, uh, I mean, some surface treatments like PDMS, if you put it in the lab for a couple of hours, it will revert back to the hydrophobic. But this actually can last for, I mean, uh, weeks in the lab, basically. So the surface property doesn't change by storage. That's good. Uh, 
Uh, you can see the paper here. This is before ablation. You can see this is for, uh, this is cellulose fibers, and you can see also silicon coating on top of that. And this is after ablation. You can see definitely the surface becomes a lot rougher. If you zoom in, you can see these these actually small fibers. This you can see some of them are nanoscale fibers. So it becomes highly porous. Uh, this is smooth actually if you touch it, uh, and becomes something like this actually after laser ablation, CO2 laser. It actually works the best with CO2 laser. And that's because of the absorption of the wavelength, uh, absorption of the paper at that wavelength, which is 10 micron, 10, 11 micron absorption. We, start, uh, we looked also chemically at this. These are XPS, uh, you know, spectra of the surface. And uh, uh, I don't go into detail, but we realized actually there are, once you do this in oxygen, uh, there are lots of SiOH groups. There are OH groups with silicon okay, attached to those. Those are, uh, those are polar groups that make surface hydrophilic. There are lots of those are also created. as So it's a combination of the chemical and physical, OH groups, and also the surface uh, roughness that you create that makes the surface hydrophilic after you treat that. You can do the same thing with wax paper, although it doesn't work as well, but wax does the same. I mean, with wax, it, it works uh, about similar to uh, parchment paper. Palette paper is actually is interesting. Palette paper is used for painting. Uh, it's, once, it's interesting, actually. We've done a lot of work with that. One side is hydrophilic, one side is hydrophobic. There is also freezer paper. Uh, we tr you can try that. We did some cool stuff with that, too. Uh, that also is one side is hydrophilic, one side is hydrophobic. So we have done a lot of work with that uh, by using the hydrophilic side as a weaking side bonded to a microchannel and then using as some sort of, uh, we did some pump, slow, uh, slow release pump. So there are a couple of interesting papers out there. We don't do anything, we go buy them, and so we use them. So it's, as you can see, they're different. I mean, they all sort of work, uh, more or less. Uh, but pallet paper was, the, was actually the best as far as uh, performance. So you can do different things. You can, you know, after you have done this, uh, you can, if you want to, uh, if you have an aqueous solution, for example, if uh, we, uh, like ferrofluid, which is a uh, magnetic nanoparticles in an aqueous suspension, uh, if you have that, you can basically uh, dip it, bring it out. Uh, you, have, you have these magnetic nanoparticles inside the paper. So you, so you can functionalize it magnetically. You can make magnetic actuators with that, for example, easily. Uh, so that's uh, with the uh, aqueous solution is easier. If it's non-aqueous, you can do a squeegee, uh, basically printing here, and then use IPA to clean it. This works better. It's cleaner, I'd say. These are some magnetic patterns. Again, uh, this is ferrofluid, uh, about 10 nanometer particle size. You can see this is, you can easily embed uh, magnetic pattern in this. Uh, Couple of com a couple of people called me after we published this. They said they were interested. So, so some people from Canada, the guy was in, in, uh, they were printing money. Uh, he was so for somehow interested <laughs> in this. And we talked a couple of times, uh, uh, not much, but he was saying that he was, uh, maybe he was, they wanted to put a pattern in some part of the money for counterfeiting or something. Uh, this is uh, wax paper again. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's similar. You can see the you know the pattern is a bit a little bit different than the other one, but it's it's, it's kind of the same. Basically, ablated area. Uh, this is zoom in pattern after. Now with wax is interesting because you can uh, make the surface hydrophilic, embed material in it, and if you reheat it, you can cover it. So you can do another layer. You can do another layer. So you can do multi layer and kind of you can build up. So it's kind of the nice thing about wax is it's. Uh, it's uh, meltable, correct? If you put it on a hot plate, it melts again. So we, we, uh, that's that's the advantage if you have a application. Uh, this is uh, a magnetic actuator. Uh, my PhD student who did this was ME. I said, well, I mean, you are ME. Uh, can you design a magnetic actuator with this? Uh, just for fun. Anyhow, this is a paper that he, I, well, I think the mechanism was interesting. Uh, with one laser, he basically, this area is, is functionalized magnetically, and these areas are cut. And then he basically did in the same, in one step, he functionalized and he cut this, and then he folded this like this on top. And we bring a permanent, so it's, it's like a tweezer basically, it's like a gripper, gripper, magnetic gripper. So by a permanent magnet coming back and forth, it would open and close and pick stuff up. So you can see here, uh, this, is a, this is the permanent magnet coming. Uh, here, you know, opening this thing, and then you can pick it, uh, let's see. Uh, well, it was a normally open position, forced open position, and then you could pick up stuff. This is a ladybug, I mean, he picked up in the lab, so uh, 
in this fun demonstration. Chemical uh, f functionalization, you can, again, these are, this is luminal. It's what they use detecting blood. So you can, again, uh, make chemical sensors potentially with this. But what we were really interested in, as I'll show you later, we wanted to embed uh, chemical sensors, electrochemical sensors into these platforms for measuring uh, pH and oxygen and other parameters that are important in the wound treatment. So these are uh, some colorimetric that has been shown, you know, with, with, uh, with several other methods that you can do on paper. So in order to make uh, electrochemical sensor, we need uh, conductive patterns on this. So we needed to put uh, lines of conductors in this. Now, there are various, we tried various things. We, we tried carbon nanotube, uh, we decided, well, I mean, that's kind of stupid because, I mean, we are trying to use uh, paper to be cheap, and carbon nanotube is not cheap. So it's, uh, that's not a good idea. So carbon, I mean, carbon uh, paste in silicone, that works good. But I mean, silver epoxy, we at the end, uh, really did a lot of silver epoxy. I'll show you the examples of this. So uh, uh, this worked the best, probably. It's, ch it's the cheapest one. Uh, so what we did, with, I mean, you can, what you can do, basically, ablate the area, basically, uh, print the silver epoxy, and bring a tape, basically, here, and peel it off. And you can leave the uh, silver epoxy here. You can make conductive traces, so, uh, sort of a screen printing method. And this is another. This is a variation of that. Well, uh, these areas are treated. These areas are uh, the areas, the grooves are the treated areas. So it's, it has adhesion, more adhesion to the, to the, and then just the tape, it comes off. At the, uh, you can also, we, we also played around a little bit with uh, aluminum foil coated parchment paper. You can buy these also. Uh, you can actually make in, you know, antennas and other things in this. You can, uh, interesting, if you have ideas too, you can try it out. Uh, this is chewing gum paper, actually. This is interesting. It, it has only two nanometer gold on it, actually. It's very easy to pattern this, actually. The resistance is also fairly decent. <laughs> so this is, you can buy these. A lot of these things are commercially available, which I, I, I enjoy doing this. So anyhow, there's a, it's a, you know, a polymer and very thin layer. Uh, we didn't do much in this, but you can, again, you can uh, try and fabricate a variety of materials on these uh, structures, on these. Uh, so we, you know, after we, we've developed this uh, technology with using laser and a variety of substrates to make uh, uh, various uh, patterns on paper, you know, conductive and non-conductive patterns. Now our next step was trying to make sensors, actuators, I'm going to show you the actuators, and power sources. Uh, power sources such as batteries. I mean, we're, we're most interested in batteries. We, you know, try to see if we can make a battery on these things. This is a, uh, and I'll show you later on what we are using some of these for. Uh, this is just a zinc uh, copper, you know, standard chemistry. This is you know, high school chemistry. Uh, that, you know, two electrodes and, you know, electrolyte bridge. So uh, you can, again, you know, we fabricate this on paper. Uh, this shows uh, you can do, this is a four cell battery. This is one cell, two cell, three cell, four cell battery. Uh, we used hydrogel as a salt bridge and uh, zinc copper on paper. Uh, this shows the uh, fabrication. We, we first uh, did silver uh, epoxy spinning and patterning. So we used silver epoxy as a base material. Then we electroplated copper and zinc on top of that. Uh, this was the salt bridges that, these are hydrogel that uh, were patterned on another substrate, which when then bonded, flipped and bonded to this. So this is the metals, and this is the salt bridges and bonded, so it's four cell battery here. Uh, this shows before and after, before and after bonding. This, was a, this is about the size of a Band-Aid, basically, four cell. Uh, you can actuate this by basically uh, putting liquid on it. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you later what we are interested in using urine right now to activate this, to put this in the diaper. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it's a decent battery. It's not the best battery, but it's good enough for what we want to do. It, it can operate for a couple of minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, this is uh, half a milliamp. Uh, this is, you can run a lot of electronics. Actually, we have a lot better than this right now. We can get up to 10 milliamp actually right now. Uh, with these batteries that is a lot more than enough for, I mean, for example, if you want to detect a signal and send it out, for example, correct? I mean, you only need really a uh, very short period of time for these things to operate. Uh, so this was, so 
uh, you can see here again, you know, open circuit voltage. This is you know, curves, load curves. So you can see it, uh, it can uh, provide three volts, the four cell, 120. Uh, this is the first version of this. For 30 minutes, this is more than enough. Uh, but this is, again, enough also for a lot of applications, depending on your system and circuit that you have. Uh, we had a couple of issues with the using uh, hydrogel. Uh, one was uh, the water was evaporating very fast. Uh, which is uh, was not a very big issue, but you know, if you want to use it once. Uh, while hydrogen was in the driest state, the samples, it had a lot of stress in it. The sample was really crumpled a lot. Uh, and it took, a, it was actually interesting. We thought the hydrogen is actually very hygroscopic, but it actually takes some time to get activated, actually, hydrogen. It's about five minutes or so, five, ten minutes to get activated, to get the water in. Really, so that was something that we thought. You know, we need maybe something faster. We used, then we realized filter paper is actually a lot better. So this is uh, again very similar structure with that fabricated on paper. With uh, here we use filter paper, and it's a lot. It, it has actually a lot better performance, also uh, compared to the hydrogel uh, battery. Uh, this is again. You can power actually. We power the calculator for. Uh, 24 hours, which is actually, uh, but you have to keep this wet, of course. But it's, it's actually a decent battery. I mean, it's not a very f sophisticated. Again, the chemistry is really is very old, but it's uh, it's a decent battery. So we did, uh, something that we are doing right now, uh, we are using this battery uh, to design a system that you can embed in diapers and to detect urinary tract infection. So this is, goes, uh, this is a device that goes in the diaper that uh, when the urine gets to this activates, the battery comes on. It measures nitrite. Nitrite in urine is a surrogate for urinary tract infection. Measures the nitrite and sends the information with wireless out. So this is for uh, actually for old people, really. Uh, it's not for kids. Uh, people who have Alzheimer's and uh, other dementias, they usually wear diaper, and urinary tract infection is, very, uh, is, 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 is a very common problem for them. So if you have nitrite, and the nice thing about nitrite is that if, usually you shouldn't have any nitrite in your urine. If you have nitrite, uh, there is an infection in your urine. So it's zero and one. And what we do here is actually, you can see this is a battery, this is a layout of it. And this is uh, what we do actually, we have changed our fabrication. We use basically, we don't use electroplating right now, we use the same laser to use a, uh, to cut actually very thin sheets of copper and zinc. And then we, uh, this is actually a, <coughs> a wax paper that then we fold and laminate. Actually, we do some lamination also. Uh, wax paper, we align, so this is, a, a, there's an LED here. Uh, when this battery comes on, LED lights on. This is a paper, is a test strip here that changes color. Once there's a nitride, there's a photo detector here that you measure the current. Uh, when you have nitride, uh, the current changes in the photo detector because the, it changes color. And we, we use that. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a wireless transmitter here that uh, is going to be a chip that's sitting here that sends the information out, basically. So it's automated. It's low cost. It eventually can go into diapers and uh, tell you know, the caregiver that if a person has urinary tract infection, so they can get, you know, sooner they can get to the culture. So it's kind of a screening, but uh, again, eventually you have to culture the urine. The, that's the golden test. So it's kind of early warning system, basically. So this is, as you can see, uh, you, you can make systems now with these things. Uh, not only the, the, a combination of power sources, uh, sensors, and transmitters, and putting everything together here. What are some of the computing products to this? I mean, this is very exciting. I would say that there's a tremendous need for, for a product like this. This is, uh, we looked actually into this uh, quite a bit. We, the, uh, there is really, no, uh, there are, Huggies have a co something called a smart diaper uh -huh. that is for kids. That it has a, uh, it's something like a page, it's kind of an electronic sitting here. There's a sensor inside, the, it's for kids that it shows it's just the kid has wet himself. Which, uh, that's not really, I would say, it's not a, uh, my kid is not using the diaper now, actually. The diapers are not actually too good. Uh, because the kids don't get potty training, actually, until very later. So the diaper, so it's not good uh, for elderly people. Now, uh, we haven't seen anything like this in the market. There is a company in New York that has developed a, an optical 
it's a, it, it goes in front of the diaper. They're advertising it for kids. Uh, that it's, a, it's an array of dots that changes color. They're claiming you can measure a variety of parameters, such as, I mean, in urine, you're interested in protein, nitride, al uh, and red blood cell, uh, white blood cell, a uh, couple of parameters. And you can take a picture with your camera, cell phone. Send it to. Uh, that's the only thing that I know that's in the market, really, right now. I mean, it's not in the market, actually. It's not. It's not. I mean, the company's website is also a little bit dysfunctional now. I don't know what's happening to that. But so, we are, I mean, we kept an eye on that, actually, because uh, it's the only thing that we know that's out there right now. That. But urinary tract infection, again, it's a very, uh, again, I mean, if you look at the market also, it's, it's really going up. Uh, Huggies, uh, uh, Procter & Gamble makes that. that yes. Uh, so they are actually moving, uh, they have identified elderly, of course. Anything that you do now for elderly, it's a huge market in the next 20 years. So that's a big market. So they're kind of putting a lot of investments into the diapers for old people. Plus is a good thing. Plus is a good thing. Yeah, especially, I mean, this, again, in a lot of nursing homes and other places, their UTI is a very big, uh, big, big problem in, in uh, these places. Uh, this show, uh, uh, going back to the wound, you know, this is again, uh, we wanted to deliver oxygen to the wound. Here shows, you know, this, uh, uh, for wound healing, you know, a lot of wounds don't heal that well if you don't have oxygen. And uh, parchment paper, we realized that's actually the best material for that, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is hydro, hydrophobic. I'll, I'll show you why it's interesting. Because, uh, we use hydrogen peroxide. We catalytically convert hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Now, hydrogen peroxide should not touch the wound, which is good, which is the hydrophobic nature of the uh, parchment paper will ensure that. However, the oxygen that we are generating in this area should be permeable. The, it, is per, it, it should reach the wound, the oxygen, uh, which actually parchment paper is very permeable to oxygen. So while it's getting the oxygen through, uh, hydrogen peroxide does not go through. So this shows a cross section of what we are doing here. We put uh, manganese dioxide here, which is a catalyst here, nanoparticles in this. Uh, it's a microfluidic system. You basically, uh, or a channel, you have channels here. You can uh, just basically push with your finger from a reservoir. Hydrogen peroxide goes here, comes out. And here in this area that's next to the wound, you generate oxygen that goes and reaches the wound bed. And this is just, you know, we, we did a lot of characterization. We, we calculated the permeability, and we compared this with actually uh, what, what is needed. It's actually exactly the, we are right on target. Uh, the, again, flow, the, the permeability, we measured the permeability to the, uh, this, this, is, this is the permeability of the parchment paper to oxygen, actually. So uh, how much oxygen you can, you know, uh, pass through this about uh, five microliter per minute per spot. I mean, it depends on the spot size. Anyhow, you can, you can use 3% hydrogen peroxide that you uh, can buy uh, from pharmacy and oxygenate, get enough oxygen to the wound that those regions to get it to the level that you need. Again, this is fabrication process. Uh, what we do is, is a, a parchment paper. We, uh, we functionalize this area that's hydropho uh, hydrophilized by uh, manganese dioxide, MnO2 is the catalyst here. And then we bond this microfluidic channel and other things that's bonded on top of this to create, to create the structure here, as you can see. This shows uh, some of the spots. As you can see, these the, uh, this brown spots uh, are the spots that has uh, the catalyst in it. This is inlet, outlet. This, this was not designed for a speci any specific wound. But you can imagine that you can actually customize this. You can take a picture of the wound and identify, you know, uh, find the regions that are hypoxic that need oxygen, and then you can fabricate this one for that specific wound and give oxygen to the areas that it's needed. Right now, what they do, there is, again, in the market, uh, people who have uh, diabetic ulcers on the food that they, there are these tanks, you, that oxygen tanks, that you put your whole food in it, basically. And you close, and then there's an oxygen tank. So it's not very convenient to do it. So this, this can be a lot, a lot easier to do it this way. This shows uh, some of the particles again. That these are attached again to this. This, 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 this is, uh, they're, they're trapped here. Uh, they're not, um, so, uh, it's pretty strong actually adhesion, uh, MnO2 uh, deposited directly. This is MnO2, uh, uh, again, 
uh, synthesized in situ. Uh, now we are working with a faculty colleague of ours that has a laser system that can push, actually, it can fabric, uh, it can uh, photochemically synthesize these catalysts throughout the paper, actually. So that's, it's a different laser system. It's a femtosecond, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, femtosecond laser system, but uh, at the different wavelengths also. But it can go uh, deep into the paper uh, and fabricate deeper if you want to uh, scale this up. Uh, so this is just some test again, you know, uh, just, uh, but uh, it's biocompatible. I mean, we're concerned about, you know, biocompatibility of the paper itself, which I real, I actually I knew it's biocompatible it's because it's, it's silicon, it's biocompatible. But we're also worried about that when we pass hydrogen peroxide, what if the hydrogen peroxide goes the other side, uh, just, you know, gets to the wound and things like that. So we, uh, we tested this in vitro. So it's going it, to, it, and it was working fine. We didn't have any problem. Uh, we are uh, now working with uh, uh, plastic surgery and burn unit at the Indiana University down there in Indianapolis to uh, try some of these on patients, actual patients. We're getting IRB approvals for uh, some of the patients they have down there. Uh, you can also put silver nanoparticles the same way that you put, we put manganese oxide nanoparticles in this. Uh, silver is a very old, is, is, non, is, is known since the Hippocrates time as an antimicrobial. And a lot of the wound dressings, they have actually silver nanoparticles in them. Uh, so you can put, you can imagine, you can, what we are not, uh, not trying to do is, you can put both of them, you, know, you can put co-synthesized probably silver nanoparticle and manganese dioxide on the same basically substrate. For example, silver nanoparticle on one side that's facing the wound, uh, MnO2 the other side that oxygen goes through and you can have simultaneous antimicrobial effect and oxygen delivery. So it's multifunctional, you can have a multifunctional uh, platform. These are some silver, you can see these are, these are MnO2 spots, these are silver spots that uh, fabricated, uh, again you can see, these are silver nanoparticles inside, in there. So as, this is what I was talking about here. Uh, silver nanoparticle loaded spots here, and then oxygen here together. Uh, oxygen sensors, uh, you know, I talked about electrochemical sensors. So we have this platform, we deliver oxygen, so we want to measure oxygen also. So you can do the same thing on the same platform, on the same paper. You can. Uh, make oxygen sensors. This is a, you can make different ways. These are electrochemical sensors. Uh, in this case, uh, we are using <coughs> uh, basically a zinc, uh, zinc and uh, carbon, I think. That it's, it's actually, it's not amperometric. This is actually potentiometric. Uh, but uh, again, oxidation reduction, and then you measure, we measure the voltage, actually, in this case. It's, uh, it's not current. Uh, here we have uh, zinc cathode and silver anode, uh, zinc anode, silver cathode. The substrate is, again, the same uh, paper that I talked about. Salt bridge, uh, hydrogel uh, loaded with electrolyte, PDMS cover. So you can see this is now we are in the process of integrating this along with those delivery spots. So we have these delivery spots that give oxygen and then also measuring oxygen at the same time at those spots. Uh, so that's uh, what we are engaged in right now. Uh, Again, this shows a, this is an oxygen sensor fabricated on parchment paper. And again, similar processes. It's uh, again, a combination of laser uh, functionalization and bonding and you know, printing material on top of the paper here. Oh, this shows just, uh, this is um, again, uh, measuring, uh, actually, uh, Measuring current, but it's actually, uh, anyhow, it's, uh, it's a redox, redox current. Uh, it's not voltage, I'm sorry. It's, it's a redox current, but uh, we measured across a resistor. Anyhow, uh, it's the sensitivity. I mean, this, this line here between uh, zero, this is percentage of oxygen, zero to 40, 50 percent. That's max. I mean, of course, uh, normal is like what? We are 20, 21 percent right now, correct? And uh, this is here, atmosphere. So you want to go, this is pretty good, 40 percent oxygen and 2.6 microamp per percent. So uh, it's, it's relatively fast, it's 17 seconds, and uh, saturates, of course, this is normal, after 45%. Uh, 
Uh, you can make pH sensor also. This, uh, these are pH sensors made uh, potentiometric uh, using polyaniline as the membrane here. Uh, we use silver, silver chloride, and carbon as this. So silver, silver chloride is the reference electrode. Carbon is the, counter, uh, the working electrode. And polyaniline here, uh, that's the membrane here. Again, uh, you can see this is, uh, and we use actually, this is, uh, we use, uh, the, uh, we laminate this guy. You know, after you can see these are, these are uh, the electrodes are fabricated here, the sensors. These are access holes that are drilled by the laser. And then you basically fold this guy and laminate this. So you can have a piece of paper that has all the sensors on it. Uh, again, these are uh, what you expect about the, the, the sensitivity, uh, minus 50 millivolt per pH. And again, it works very nice. But the, the issue is, I mean, the question is that, you know, the, how long these can last, uh, that's everybody. I, I mean, uh, we have tested these uh, in, uh, uh, in vitro, uh, in, uh, and they last for, uh, again, depending on how, how often you measure. Uh, if you measure them very frequently, they don't last as long. But I mean, these are again, you have to consider these are the dressings that are, I mean, they have to be changed every 24 or 48 hours. So they don't have to last like a week. So, but uh, they last 48 hours uh, if you don't measure, if you measure them every, every hour or two or something like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty decent, I would say. Uh, this shows a silver sensor, again, the same technique, you know, if you have silver nanoparticles, you know, we are interested in seeing that, you know, how, how much uh, we're the, developing some of these for our colleagues. They have a lot of silver dressings, and, but they wanted to know how much silver is getting to the wound. Uh, these are, they're used a lot. Silver is used a lot for burn, actually, patients. They put a lot of silver on them. Uh, so these are some, again, uh, this is a silver sensor, uh, again, uh, similar technique here that we used for, uh, Sensing here, this is potentiometric sensor. So we measure. So as you can see, we have uh, created a variety of sensors uh, that are relevant to the wound uh, management of the wound pH for uh, measuring wound infection. When the wound is infected, uh, the pH changes. Uh, oxygen. Uh, the wounds when they don't have enough oxygen, they they don't heal well. Correct. Silver. Uh, if you have silver, you know, as dressing, you know, if you're interested in. Uh, measuring silver delivery to the wound. But I would say pH and oxygen are the two main ox uh, chemical parameters we are interested in measuring. And also uh, delivery for oxygen, which is actually the most important parameter in wound healing. Uh, we can use the same systems of, I mean, you can envision, you can use the same system to deliver uh, same microfluidic channels and things like that to deliver antibiotics or growth factors and things like that. So it's, it's a really uh, uh, interesting generic system, generic platform that can be used in not only wound, per, I mean, this is, again, in some other applications that you can envision in environmental sensing, uh, low cost. Again, these are fabricated with the uh, vision that these are going to be low cost disposable systems. Now, let me say a few uh, last five minutes or so. A couple of things that we have done uh, a little bit different in the last couple of months here. Uh, uh, we, as, as, you know, as I mentioned, we are interested in also uh, uh, stretchable sensors. I mean, these were flexible. I mean, you, I mean, you don't need to stretch these uh, that much. But uh, for applications, a lot of medical applications, you need also the sensor to be stretchable. Uh, you need to be able to stretch, for example, for soft robotics and things that you mount on, you know, elbow or knee and, you know, things. Uh, there's lots of good and interesting applications for this. So uh, people have done, uh, people have made stretchable uh, sub uh, interconnects with various ways. But we are again, since we, have, we are very interested in laser and we are in love with our laser, what we did, we, uh, we decided to do, uh, we see if we could do uh, stretchable uh, interconnects and also strain gauges with uh, laser. So uh, you can do this actually very easily. Uh, this is a polyimide substrate. Uh, you can carbonize, you can pyrolyze or carbonize uh, polyimide by laser selectively. It means that uh, it burns into carbon nanomaterial, uh, which has actually you can find in the material that's left there, you can find carbon nanotubes, you can find actually some graphenes. Uh, not a single layer, but three layer or four layer graphene and some carbon particles. So you can carbonize. 
And that's nothing new. I mean, so I, I thought it was new. Then I realized actually last month that was not new. This was done in the 80s, actually. So I was disappointed <laughs> on, on that. Uh, but what we did was basically, so what uh, was, was to transfer these to a PDMS. So that was our contribution, which was no, nobody has done this. So you basically pull PDMS on top of this and peel it off. And you can make uh, you can make very stretchable, very interesting sensors actually out of this. There are some interesting properties which I'll show you. As you can see here, you can make a you know a, an air you know a zigzag for, and this is uh, you can stretch these guys. I'll show you a better picture. This is uh, this again LED. You can stretch it to you can stretch it to more than a hundred percent actually. Gauge factor, when it gets, you can have gauge factors up t t uh, 10 to 20,000, actually, around 100%. Uh, this shows uh, what's actually, we looked very interesting. Uh, we looked more closely at what's, what, what's happening here. You can see this is, a, this is a polyimide. And this is carbon, carbonized regions after we transfer it. It's not a 100% transfer, but there's about 80% transfer of material to the other side. You can see these are, there is a directionality to this that you can see there is in this direction, actually. And this has to do with the way we raster, the laser is rastered on the, on the substrate. These are some carbon, you know, very small nanoscale fibers. They're nanofibers, they're not nanotubes. And this shows about, that's, this is polyimide, this is the top surface, it's very porous. So you can use this for supercapacitors, batteries, and other things uh, to fabricate on top of this. Now, we, then we put PDMS on this, and then we peel it off. After you peel it off, as you can say, PDMS, it, it penetrates PDMS into this fluffy stuff, like grass, and then it, it, it comes off. Now, this is a, now you can stretch this guy. Now, this is four of these lines. They're stretched in this direction and in this direction. Something we realize, because of this directionality of these fibers, you can get a very large change in the resistance while it's stretched in this direction. Uh, in the transverse direction, you don't get much at all, basically. And it has to do with the fact that these fibers are like this. So when you stretch it this way, uh, the contact points start decreasing, correct? And whereas in this direction, it doesn't. So this is uh, it's, it's an interesting technique. Uh, you can, again, uh, this is very easy to make, uh, up to 100% stretchability, very large gauge factors, and uh, you can put it on top of the, this is on top of a glove here to measure joint angle. You can see as you moving your fingers like this, it's easy to do that. Now, a uh, final method, this is, I guess, uh, sewing method. Uh, this is, <laughs> no, it doesn't have anything with laser. Uh, I was always interested in seeing that if we can do something with sewing machine. I was always fascinated with sewing machines from my childhood when my mom had one. Uh, it's very, you can buy this sewing machine singers for like 200 bucks. It's uh, one of the most sophisticated manufacturing equipment. And I don't know who became, there must be genius who, who came up with this thing right now. I mean, an absolute genius. Singer, I think, was the first guy in the 19th century. But now it's fully automated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that it has a lot of capabilities. And we don't know how to, I mean, we, we knew what, I mean, what we did was to make a, uh, stretchable interconnect with this. But you can do probably a lot more things with this. We haven't been able to clever so far to use other aspects of this. But what happens here, uh, there are two, I mean, two threads, okay, with the sewing machine. One, they call this bobbin, it's from bottom, and the other one is from the top, okay, coming threading from the needle, come down. Now, uh, we use what we use. We use two, uh, we use a PVA, polyvinyl alcohol thread. A PVA is a polymer that you can, it, you can dissolve it in warm water. It basically it dissolves off. The other one we use a wire, a small wire basically. You can buy spools of wire. What we do th then we sew this on top of a transparency. Correct. It's it's sewed. Now once you sew, these are locked. Sewing it goes. It, uh, Nice animations, but they lock these things. Now, we wanted to transfer this to PDMS to make a stretchable substrate, correct? But now, you pour P we pour PDMS here, and then after curing, we put this thing in warm water to dissolve the PVA. Then it comes off, correct? It's like, it's just like the two seams comes off, correct? We dissolve one of the wires. And these are just zigzag patterns, you know, you can, with this guy, you can do all sorts of I mean, different patterns. Here, here is what, how it's made. 
it's basically. And uh, these actually can stretch up to 500%. And they don't, I mean, these are good for interconnects. For interconnect, you want a stretchable substrate that the resistance shouldn't change. The other one was a strain gauge. You wanted the changes, correct? So you want two different things, different app. So these are actually very, I mean, very stretchable. Again, you know, these are because it's wire; it doesn't break. You know, unless, unless there is, you know, your PDMS breaks down or something, if, if you pull it. Here shows, you know, we put it. On the t this is a Foley catheter; goes to bladder. So this is just a sensor. We want to show that it's an inductive sensor, so you can uh, measure how much your catheter is inflated. Uh, again, we wanted to show. A, an application of it. <laughs> I don't know if it's any useful or not, but anyhow, this is the goes to bladder actually, so you can inflate this. So you can see this is inductance. Uh, the diameter, of course, diameter gets bigger, inductance gets bigger, double E. Electromagnetic course, correct? Uh, you, can, uh, you can do actually, if you made a tactile sensor, you can use the same technique. We can transfer this to a latex uh, no, glove and uh, put a capacitive sensor, tactile sensor at the tip of it, so you can basically measure force, uh, capacitance in this case, or core, or no force here. Uh, so, this, actually, I was always, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I talked to a urology, head of urology at IU about, so, well, you know, the rectal exams, when they do, you know, there is no, the feedback is just feeling. So, well, uh, do you want to put a sensor there? You know, can we put a sensor there and things like that? He was not very receptive. He said, well, if you're suspicious, we'll do biopsy. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I was always disappointed he was not so interested because you can do this actually easily. You can uh, measure. But I think, I think there's a use for that. I mean, so, I mean, you cannot trust one guy's judgment. But uh, anyhow, this is easy to do. So let me find, I mean, the, the stop here. This is, uh, again, this is tape, this is scotch tape, uh, and it's hygroscopic. And you can use laser to uh, make structures such as these. Uh, this is uh, one side of the magic tape. It's actually, uh, it absorbs humidity, it swells, so it can pop out, correct? Uh, so if you put it in a humid environment, you can, you can make grabbers like this, actually. Nothing fancy, it's just uh, uh, pieces of scotch tape. No, you can, you can also make it walk. Like this, correct? It's just, and this is, uh, so this goes, anyhow, this is <laughs> for fun. <laughs> uh, this is cute. Uh, thanks, I appreciate your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank my grad students, former and current, some of them that were involved in this, and my colleagues, uh, Ali Khadem Hosseini, and these guys from Mehmet and Samir from uh, Every Effort, and uh, some of my colleagues at IU. And uh, I'll be happy to. Answer any question. Beautiful. Questions. We have lots of time for questions. Costas. You mentioned the lack of 48 hours, but the common failure mechanism. For what? For the? The, the ones that were uh, made in the last paper, right? You said the decarbonization of 48 hours. The, uh, 40, I mean, the chemical sensors you're saying. Or yeah, yeah. The chemical sensors, uh, well, the thing is that uh, you have an electrolyte bridged, I mean, membrane there that has, you know, ions in it. And that gets depleted over time. And then you have drift also. Uh, so after 24 hours, uh, you get a lot of drift after 24 hours for, or 48 hours. Depending on, uh, the more you measure, I mean, once, when you measure pH or, you know, oxygen, you are consuming those chemicals, actually. So that kind of, you're depleting your, your sensors, basically. But so that's, that's the main reason. No, not with the parchment paper, no. It's actually fairly uh, with parchment paper because it's hydrophobic. And the areas that are, I mean, the areas that are functionalized are, are like, let's say, wire, you know, lines or s spots. Uh, I assume that if you have a large area that's functionalized, it might warp, but we didn't see any warping, really. Uh, when we put hydrogel on it, as I showed with those batteries, hydrogel shrink a lot. We put, when you put hydrogel, those dry out, they, they crumple. Not with, the, not with just, the particles and things like that, it's okay. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for the carbon dioxide layer of uh, laser, when using the uh, carbon paper, do you get any sort of uh, grain direction or is it just not? Uh, so on the uh, hydrophobic 
No, it was no, it was not because of the it's uh, you know paper is very you know amorphous material. I mean they're just random. The fibers are randomly oriented, so we didn't see any function. I mean, with the uh, the last one I showed you, we, we saw directionality, uh, the poly emit, but not with the not with the paper. The paper was just random. I think it was just became porous in the random directions. Uh, no, we use just PDMS uh, as as a backing, or you know, you can no. Is, uh, we use uh, the standard microfluid. I mean, there's molding techniques for the PDMS. Uh, we don't use laser on PDMS. Although you, I mean, you can use it. We have used it to make holes in it, but uh, not as far as no. We, uh, we haven't. I mean, you can, uh, you can maybe functionalize it, but PDMS, what you can't. I mean, with the uh, you can do it with the uh, plasma gun. You know, just standard. But I haven't, I haven't tried that. Uh, well, it seems like uh, you had uh, your hydrogen pattern over your Over what? Over your hydrogen over for your battery? Yes. So I, was, I have a question how, how you were able to pattern your hydrogen. The hydrogen was similar. I mean, we, we treated the paper uh, and then hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and then we just dipped it into the pre gel solution. Oh, yeah. Oh, it yeah. Pre gel solution, yeah. Because it's hydrophilic, that area. We have not, no, bio, uh, incorporating bios, no. Luminol, let's see, we do the luminol one. Is that immobilized or just placed? It was just placed. Imo the, uh, the one I showed you, the blue one, that was luminol. Is that, yeah, that one is the only one that we have done, and uh, it was bio stuff on it. Blood, I guess we sprayed blood at the end, <laughs> became blue, yeah. You know, I get so fascinated by this new way of doing things, and I and I honestly believe we do less of and less of that these days in our field. I don't know if you agree with me. Yeah. How do we motivate our students to take risks and to do crazy things that may actually turn into something really exciting? I think that's the fun of it. I would say. I, I think. Don't you guys think so? It's just. I think a lot of these. The fun. I mean the. Uh, I like these because you, an undergrad can do this one afternoon, a lot of this in the lab. And what I was frustrated always with going to clean, you know, it took six months some person to go to clean room, uh, learn deep RIE, bonding, and things like that. And then we publish a lot more right now. With, I mean, I'm serious about yes, this. Then, I, I, mean, it's, I mean, it comes out like, I mean, undergrads, and I, I have a lot of undergrads in there. And it's really, I mean, they enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's fun for everybody, I think, yes. actually. Because it's it's quick turnaround, they can see what they have done in one afternoon or maybe a couple of afternoons. I mean, it's very fast, and that's what I like about it. And it really it, uh, it uh, encourages you to think creatively to create some of these things. I think that's uh, my view. Is I guess the simplicity is the ultimate. I mean, that's what Steve Jobs said. Is that right? Simplicity is the ultimate complexity. Correct uh, sophistication. That's what he said. I think quoting, uh, quoting him. But it's some of this stuff is really. It's uh, again. Uh, I have fun. I mean, again, the students. I hope they have fun too. I think they do actually. They, my students are uh, again. They seem to have fun doing these things. And it's quick. I mean, they can do this. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you know, it's just you know, you do something else. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And it doesn't cost that much, again, these things. You know, it's just a very, uh, very low cost. It's nice. I mean, it's, I think the way to go. So take risks, have fun, and if it doesn't work, move on. Move on. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> we, should, I should write, we should write down that. <laughs> Anyhow, let's give our speaker another round. Thank you. Professor Ziad is going to hang around, so I encourage